Welcome to Miracles in the Book of Acts with Dr. Peter McLuhan. Our topic today is Miracles in Troas. In last week's program, we learned how Paul brought the gospel to Ephesus. Initially, Paul was denied permission to speak in Ephesus when he left Pisidian Antioch in Acts chapter 16. But now the Holy Spirit has finally opened the door for Paul and his team to preach the gospel in the city of Ephesus. Luke wrote that God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away, and the sick and their diseases left them, and evil spirits came out of them. Acts chapter 19, verse 11 and 12. Paul stayed in Ephesus longer than any other place he ministered. Many people became followers of Jesus. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in tongues. Miracles were released. Demonized people were set free. Paul established a ministry school whose students carried the message of Jesus from Ephesus to all of the surrounding villages and towns. Luke wrote that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks, Acts chapter 19 and verse 10. People burned their magic books and symbols and turned away from worshiping Artemis. The word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily, Acts 19 verse 20. <clears throat> While in Ephesus, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians and sent Timothy back to Corinth to check on them, he also shared his vision for future ministry with his closest leaders. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 21, we read, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. In Athens, Paul had preached Jesus in the intellectual center of the world. In Corinth, Paul had preached Jesus in the commercial center of the world. In Ephesus, Paul had preached Jesus in the financial center of the world. There is one more city that Paul not only wanted to visit, he said, I must see. Paul said, I must visit Rome and preach Jesus in the political capital of the Roman Empire. Luke uses the word must 31 times in his gospel and in the book of Acts. And there are certain things that followers of Jesus must do. These must-dos relate mostly to our character development. However, for ministers and leaders, there are must-dos that guide the vision the Lord gives to us. And it's important for leaders to know the difference between what we can do and what we must do. Must-dos require discipline and planning and preparation. And Paul did indeed visit Rome, but that was still more than five years away. In the meantime, Paul sent Timothy and Erastus to Macedonia to prepare for Paul's second visit to the churches in that region. After Timothy and Erastus left Ephesus, a riot broke out against Paul in the theater. The chief officials of the city rushed into the theater to quiet down the crowd. They'd shouted for two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Once again, Paul was protected by the actions of a city council. Luke wrote, After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia, Acts chapter 20 and verse 1. Paul traveled first to Troas looking for Titus, but when he did not find him, he sailed across the Aegean Sea back to the port of Philippi. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Jesus, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus. So I took leave of them and went to Macedonia. While visiting one of the Macedonian churches, 
Paul found Titus and was greatly comforted by his report on the Corinthian followers of Jesus. But Paul, but God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us with the coming of Titus, said Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 6. So while there, Paul wrote 2 Corinthians and had his letter sent to them. And after visiting the churches in Macedonia, Paul visited the churches in Greece, including returning to Corinth, from where he had hoped to sail back to Cyprus. In another protective miracle, Paul was made aware of another plot to kill him. And when that plot against him by the Jews, uh, when he was about to set sail for Syria because of that plot, he decided to return through Macedonia, Acts chapter 20 and verse 3. Luke goes on to tell us how much his ministry team had grown, how much Paul's ministry team had grown. There was Sopater from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy from Lystra, Tychicus and Trophimus from Asia Minor. Acts chapter 20 and verse 4. This is a large team made up of people from the major cities that Paul had visited. I pray that God helps you as you lead the team of spiritual people that God has raised up to spread the message of Jesus through your ministry. Now, beginning in Acts chapter 20 and verse 6, Dr. Lute writes himself back into the story as an eyewitness. This is the second we section in the book of Acts. I'd made mention of the first we section back when we visited Philippi. And now here in Troas, these went aboard while they were waiting for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And after five days, we came to them in Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Acts chapter 20, verse 5 and 6. So notice how Dr. Luke includes himself, himself in the story by saying, we sailed, we came, and we stayed. This is a critical point for Luke to write himself back into the story because in Troas, Paul raises a young boy who died back to life. This is how it happened on the first day of the week. When we had gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight, Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. I've been in situations just like that. I'm about to leave a country I've been visiting, but people want me to share the word of God with them one more time. The message goes long, but people still want more. That's exactly what happened in Troas. We read that a young man by the name of Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer, and being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Acts chapter 9, chapter 20, and verse 9. Now, as a physician, Dr. Luke was able to verify that the boy had died as a result of falling to the ground. The houses were close together in Troas. No doubt he fell onto a stone road in front of the house where they were meeting. Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in the arms, he said, Do not be alarmed. His life is still in him. Acts chapter 20, verse 10. And Paul writes about this incident as though it were nothing at all. He goes back up and continues speaking to the people. This most likely indicates that Paul had raised many people from the dead. Consider the statement that Paul made before the council in Jerusalem. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? What a great question. Acts 26 and verse 8. Now, there are 10 stories in the Bible about people who have been raised from the dead. They are there to teach us that God does indeed raise the dead. In each of these stories, there are powerful lessons on how to raise the dead. 
Jesus himself commanded his followers to heal the sick and to raise the dead. Whenever I travel overseas, I ask ministry leaders if they have raised anyone from the dead. Many have. I've heard remarkable stories of how people who died before their time, especially babies or young people, have been raised back to life. I remind you that Paul invited all of the followers of Jesus to follow the example that he had set. And Paul expected followers of Jesus to be able to raise the dead. And someone listening to this story is being prepared by this message to raise somebody from the dead. When the Holy Spirit thrusts you into that moment, remember this story. Here are some simple things to do. Invite the Holy Spirit to fill the place where you are. Rebuke the spirit of death. Call the person's spirit back to their body. A friend of mine was preaching in India when a lady rushed into the meeting where he was preaching in the middle of a sermon and put her dead body of her baby into his arms. <clears throat> the eyes of all were upon him, and without any training on how to raise the dead, he spoke life over the baby, and the baby started breathing again. Now listen to this message many times, and make yourself available to God to be used by him to raise the dead. And if you want to learn more about raising the dead, write to me, and I'll send a message to you on more details about raising the dead. But if you've just lost a loved one, especially a young person, a child, or a baby, do exactly what you heard me say. Holy Spirit, fill the place where this has just happened with life and hope. Spirit of death, I break your power. Release your grip on this precious life. Child, I command your spirit to return to you. Breathe and come alive by the power of Jesus flowing through these words. Mother, write to me and tell me what God just did for your family. You need a miracle. Put your hand where you are hurting or have a wound. Be healed now in the name of Jesus. Pain go. Wounds be restored. Cancers go in Jesus' name. If you received a touch from Jesus, write to me and let me know what God has just done for you. Luke wrote, the next day we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for he had arranged, intending for himself to go by land. Acts chapter 20, verse 13. Next week, I'll comment on Paul's solitary walk to Assos. Join us then as we continue studying miracles in the book of Acts. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk with someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as $1 a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations to Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God God bless you and fill you with living hope.